Good day, everyone. On behalf of BioIT World Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Wyatt Technology, I'd like to welcome you to Predicting and Evaluating the Stability of Therapeutic Protein Formulations by Dynamic Light Scattering and Machine Learning. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and the moderator for today's event. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. He is Lorenzo Gentiuomo, Master of Science, PIPPI Consortium Fellow for Wyatt Technology. Welcome, Lorenzo. The presenter ball is yours. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for the kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here today. And welcome, everybody, to today's webinar. Uh, you might wonder why do we have uh, dynamic light scattering and machine learning into the same webinar. And the idea behind it is that when we have such a high throughput of technologies, then there is a staggering increase in the opportunity for finding partners in data. And the process of finding this partner is usually called data mining, and machine learning is part of such a process. And let's start with an overview of today's webinar. And I will start introducing you the PP project, which is the project I'm working with. And then I will go through protein-protein interaction by high throughput dynamic light scattering and static light scattering. So how you can use those two technology to study protein-protein interaction and some theory behind protein-protein interaction. Then finally, we will go to the core of the today's webinar, which is the, the data or some of the project we are working on. And the first one is the uh, PP formulation screening. And then we will go through uh, new approaches to study physical stability of monoclonal antibody. And finally, we will go to the machine learning part of the webinar, which is the application of artificial neural network to protein formulation development. Let's have a look what the PP project is then. So PP stands for protein excipient interaction and protein protein interaction. And the PP consortium is formed by a series of um, companies and universities in Europe and it's led by the Technical University of, of Denmark where Pernil Harris is the, is, the, um, is the head and you can find more information on the PP project itself or about the consortium or who is part of this project at this website. And we are a series of scientists Different, from different fields, uh, for example from structural and computational biology to biophysicists, chemists, pharmacists and so on. And our overall goal is to develop a database to uh, enhance the protein formulation development. And here in the picture you can see where I am, I'm this guy. And now let's see what the PP project is about. The overall goal of the project is to produce a database to direct more successful approaches to protein formulation development. And we want to have this database online by the end of the project where the database is based on a protein library of 18 protein, or at least we are studying 18 proteins so far, which is the most representative as possible of the protein into the market. And the core of this database is based on the basic characterization which is uh, 24 formulation as a function of um, salt concentration and uh, pH and another 24 formulation as a function of excipient and their concentration. And from this uh, work package, so from this data set, we want to select some um, some of this uh, formulation to make a more in-depth molecular characterization where we want to relate the uh, structural properties to the solution behavior. And of course we want also to characterize the critical um, formulation attributes for, doing, for having successful uh, formulation development. Let's step in the second part of this introduction about protein-protein interaction and how we can study it by dynamic light scattering and static light scattering. And if you want to know more about dynamic light scattering or the DLS theory, 
then I would recommend you to have a look to the webinar you can find at wired.com or the theory that is always again on uh, wired.com. And we have just stated that we are measuring protein protein interaction in an high throughput fashion. And this is possible thanks to the DynaPro plate tweeter, which, is, which measure in uh, micro well plates and can do temperature around between 4 and 85 degrees. And you can find more information on the wire.com. And we use this instrument in the PP Consortium because actually it can give you a very good understanding on the physical stability of your protein formulations. Uh, of course, does it best on the colloidal stability part, as you see, since you can measure viscosity, polydispersity, size, molecular weight, and finally the interaction parameters. We will talk more about those two parameters in the next slides. And then you can follow also over the temperature ramp. And thanks to the Dynapro plate 3 the 3 you can either follow by size or by molecular weight at the same time. So then you can actually uh, really understand if you have a temperature of aggregation, so if it's aggregating or if it's unfolding. Uh, or you can work also in an isothermal fashion and get isochem isothermal chemical denaturation experiment. And again, since you can ramp up the temperature, you can also follow the interaction parameters as a function of temperature. But let's have a look immediately on how we can measure um, protein protein interaction by dynamic light scattering and we can do that just following the concentration dependence of the translational diffusion coefficient and the idea is that the diffusion coefficient is often written in terms of a polynomial of solute concentration and in the dilute concentration limit the, polycom the polynomial uh, becomes uh, um, this one where we just use one viral coefficient here and this KD, which is the, um, the slope of this line, is actually uh, our correction term for higher concentration and uh, is a measure of the pairwise protein protein interaction. But we have just said that we can measure both dynamic light scattering and static light scattering at the same time. So when we are doing an experiment to measure in KD, thanks to the static light scattering, we would get also the second viral coefficient. Uh, which is called B22 or uh, for historical reason uh, A2 when measured by light scattering would be the apparent B22 and this is a measure again of the strength of the pairwise intermolecular interaction and when A2 is uh, lower than zero we will have an attractive interaction when A2 is zero we would have an ideal behavior and finally when A2 is higher than zero we would have a repulsive interaction and for KD is a bit more tricky um, so there is literature on, on that, so KD, uh, a negative KD is not always, um, doesn't mean always an attractive interaction, could still be repulsive and the offset of KD is uh, depending on different uh, molecular properties, so it will differ from protein to protein, so it's a bit more difficult to understand if you have a repulsion or an attraction, but uh, it's still perfect for ranking your formulation. So let's have a look to the theory behind B22, which suggests the experimental measurable of the DLVO theory or proximity energy framework, and those are just two theory which uh, represent or try to represent the pairwise protein protein intermolecular interaction or macromolecule macromolecule intermolecular interaction and they, I found the proximity energy framework uh, rather simple to keep in mind uh, which make it very valuable for protein protein um, formulation development in fact this is just a framework of potential energy where the most notable difference between the, those energies is then in their distance dependence here and uh, we know that the charge charge potential drop off rather slowly while the dispersion or the van der Waals interaction becomes significant only when the molecular the molecules are nearly touching and if you put all together this um, potential energy you should get a function like that and uh, where the depth of the aggregation is here 
and then it's easy to describe, for example, why the ionic strength, uh, in increasing of the ionic strength, should uh, give a faster aggregation because uh, low ionic strengths it means that the charge charge interaction is uh, not shielded, so it's 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 uh, prominent, let's say, and then for the two molecules to get close, it's more difficult. While if they have higher ionic strength, we are shielding all this um, interaction here, so the electrostatic one, and of course then, since the charge charge um, potential energy drop for drop off rather slowly, which is the most important, then the activation energy here is going to be lower, then it's going to be easier for the molecules to uh, to interact with each other. But on the other way, if you put higher, more salt, so if you use higher ionic strength, and this is a positive effect on the, um, on the aggregation, this means that most probably your protein has a very high charge um, dipole interaction, or generally a very, high, very strong dipole moment, and if you are depleting all this potential energy and the aggregation is led by the dipole moment, uh, in this case then the salt may have a very uh, positive effect because it's depleting every, every, all of them here, but essentially this would be the, the reason of the aggregation in that case. So if P22 is that important, why are we measuring KD at all? Firstly, first, from a historical point of view, KD was the only one accessible in high throughput. Uh, while now also P22 can be uh, measured in high throughput by the Dynapro Plate 3 3 But KD has shown himself a key biophysical properties for formulation. And one of the latest publications in this direction comes from the Tomar group, uh, where they measure KD for antibody formulation in late stage, and they could see a relationship between KD and the apparent solubility, the thermal instability, the rheology, and the electrostatic properties of the formulation. And this is a general thing, so KD is not only about protein interaction, there is something more there. In fact, KD is not just a colloidal stability indicator. It's not related only to the protein-protein interaction, and it's composed by a series of contributing parts, and only one of these parts is actually the thermodynamical contribution from B22. So if you want to have information about protein-protein interaction only, then you may want to have A2, while KD is a key biophysical properties in general for formulations. We have been talking about dynamic light scattering, static light scattering, and how we use those two technologies to gather information on protein physical stability. And now I want to give you an overlook about the PP formulation screening. And we talk about the PP consortium in the previous slide in the, in the introduction. And before going into the data, I want to thank everybody in the consortium because, of course, this have been a, a, a great team effort. So there's the first step we took in the creation of the PP database was the first screening. And in this first screening, we screen 18 protein uh, as a function of pH and ionic strength, so for 24 uh, formulation in this case. And we characterize those 24 formulation with a series of technique. And uh, then there was also a computational screen where we carried out the calculation for the 3D structure of all the protein, all the 24 different formulation with the relative uh, molecular descriptors. And this was just the first step. 
and we will talk about this first step in the in the next slides. Uh, but generally, we worked also on uh, a different set of formulation uh, where we considered also various excipients. And from the screening, we gathered a series of outputs, and here I listed the most important one. And we can divide these outputs in two classes. One, which uh, comes from the stress assay uh, that was carried out by dynamic light scattering and size exclusion chromatography coupled with multi angle light scattering. And uh, a second one, which were collected with several different techniques, uh, which gather a series of protein stability indicator, like colloidal stability indicator, conformational stability indicator, and so on. And then we have a third class, which is the the one from the computational screening. And the stress assay uh, we uh, collected for the first screening was only one time point of two weeks uh, of stress at uh, 25, 40 and 50 degree while for the second step we gather more um, time points and more than 75 percentage of those output for each per per formulation and protein so for each condition was collected by either a batch static or dynamic light scattering with a dynapro plate reader tool or with a fractionation so using size exclusion chromatography uh, using multi-angle light scattering uh, in this case is a, a trios 2 so only three angles which for protein is just enough and an optilab t-rex so refractive index detector and regarding the thermal stability of uh, our protein, here I plotted 5 out of the 18 protein we collected as a function of the pH and divided by the ionic strength. And all the formulation had the same um, concentration of buffer, but here we have zero uh, salt added to this, to this buffer, then here we have 70 millimolar of salt and 140 millimolar. And in blue we have the uh, temperature of aggregation measured by uh, dynamic light scattering and all the other colors are temperature of unfolding, so onset temperature and so on. And we have both the extrinsic fluorescence, so classic uh, uh, DSF with sub-orange, and intrinsic one, so collected by nano uh, DSF. But the take-home message of this slide is that TAG does not always correlate with TM. And uh, if we look here at P1 uh, without salt, we can see that the temperature of aggregation for the formulation with low pH have the same value of the temperature of uh, unfolding, the onsen temperature of unfolding, here in blue and red. And when we are reaching the PI, of uh, our uh, molecule, this is an antibody, so around 7.58, we can see the aggregation starts even before the unfolding. And generally, this is true for, or the TIAC does not correlate, it's true in almost all the cases. So we can have cases in which it's pretty similar, like, like here, but generally it can be higher, can be lower, or it can cross let's say the onset temperature of unfolding and so on. And everybody likes real number to describe um, the thermal stability of our product. I mean, in general, everybody likes numbers, but the unfolding and the aggregation are very complex problems. So can we get more information from our data? So we got TIAG in a way that we have also a curve shape. Can we get more information from the, gorse, the, um, the curve shape? And of course we can. So if we look at this case, which is a very particular case, so usually in TIAG you have a baseline, and then a very steep on, um, aggregation here. Then you go very crazy, so not like 15 here, but like 1000 or so, where you cannot trust anymore the autocorrelation function. But in this case you have oligomers at the beginning which are disassociating with the, with the temperature 
so getting almost back to the monomer and then we have a first step of aggregation a plateau and a second step of aggregation which is not that critical as I said and this is saying to us that this protein most probably have a, 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 an equilibrium between the monomer and the complex which if it is dependent from the temperature it could also be dependent from concentration from the pH and salt and so on so this is giving us more uh, a clear understanding that this protein is behaving in different way than what you would expect uh, only based on TIAC and that most probably this first part is reversible so we tested it and I can confirm you that this is reversible while the second part of the aggregation is, is, is not reversible so overall can give us um, a better understanding of the aggregation behavior to do problem solving in for protein formulation development We talk about protein thermal stability, but what about protein pole interaction? We talk so much of um, the theory of proximity energy framework and so on. Let's have a look at the measurable of this theory. So A2, uh, this is measured with a plate with a three. Um, this is an antibody and we have formulation with the same buffer in different, um, in different pHs, so from five to eight. And you can see that more or less all the curve at low pH looks more or less the same, they're going to give the same A2. As soon as you reach the um, the PI of this molecule, so which is around 8, so this is 7.5 in green here, and this is 8, we go from a positive A2, which is repulsive, to a negative. And the first question you may have, why all these lines are more or less similar, so why they are giving the same A2 more or less. You can see a difference but it's, it's very tiny. And the thing is that if you think about the charge charge repulsor, so again back to the uh, to the theory, uh, this repulsion between the molecule can shield short range attractive energies like the hydrophobic interactions which it's more probably the case in this case because we're reaching the PI or, or the dipole moment from being accessible. And let's demonstrate this. So let's shield this charge and let's see what happened. And of course if we take pH 6 here and we put it here and we had salt, so 70 or 140 millimolar, we are shielding these charges and we are killing this effect and we get more or less an A2 which is similar to zero, which is what you should expect. And as we said this is a, a general effect so you should expect that the the shape of the KD as a function of, of the pH in general is uh, flattened uh, by the screening effect of the salt and if you have this kind of uh, flattening here but then you see a positive effect on the aggregation anyhow that could be because of your aggregation is led by hydrophobic or dipole, in, dipole interaction this kind of interactions but at the end of the day, we know that all these protein stability indicators we are looking at, like TAG, A2, KD, and so on, they're not always correlating with a long term stability study. So, before taking a pro uh, formulation uh, in this step, we really want to have at least an accelerated stress assay. And this is the case here when we have an accelerated stress assay, so two weeks at 50, uh, 40, and 25 degrees. And those were measured by dynamic light scattering batch, so the naive sample, and by SECMALS. And since the data set here is really big, even to showing is really difficult, what we did is to divide all these um, data points in 17 classes based on the monomer retention that we have, so from T0 to T1 and so on, and based on the apparent autodynamic radius. So if we have a very good monomer retention, so 50 degree higher than 80 percentage, then we would give an A uh, for the segments. And if the autodynamic radius is not really changed by the two weeks at 50 degree, then we would give again an A. So this would be an AA class. Um, and so on we can give a B if it's lower than 0.8 50 degree and so on so we'll, we'll have with this classification an idea of what SECMALS is saying to us and what DLS is saying to us and in the next slide we will see this kind of circle 
uh, which is just a way of quickly representing all these data points. And the first circle here, so the, the, the one, the, the biggest one, um, represent pH 5, while the internal one represent pH 9. So there we have 5, 5.5, 6 and so on. And here we have 5 out of the 18 products we collected, again divided by the salt concentration and as a function of pH, represented by the circle. And on the right here we have all the color for the 17 classes. And as you may see immediately, in most of the cases, um, the result from the cyclic chromatography and the result from the um, DLS, from, from the naive sample, disagree. For example, here we have a very bad behaving protein formulation by at least size exclusion chromatography and a very good behaving formulation by dynamic light scattering. Or differently, we could have formulation in which the size exclusion chromatography is telling us that we have no monomer loss, but the other dynamic radius is very high. And for the sake of time, now we cannot go in all the different cases, but the take home message is that you really need during the stress assay to have both a naive sample um, to be measured and the size exclusion chromatography because the size exclusion chromatography you are measuring a different concentration at the end because you have the dilution of the column and you are measuring on a different buffer because if you have, for example, a reversible association, the salt, which is, could be led by the dipole model, for example, the salt is going to kill this immediately. So you would see different results in the size exclusion. So having both the measurements can really give you a pretty good understanding of your formulation. And now the question could be, you did all this screening and uh, the stressors say and so on, but do you have an understanding of what you did? And the idea is that we had an understanding even before we were doing the measurement, because of course before going into the measurement you have to design your experiment. And if the design of the experiment is done properly, then you can apply responsive phase methodology. And the responsive phase methodology consists just of a group of mathematical and statistical techniques, which are very sound and robust in this case, that, for example, allow you to establish your relationship within the, between the output, TM, TAG, and so on, and your inputs. So in our case, we have just two inputs, which is a very good thing, so it means that we can actually plot this. And uh, we can also determine the significance of the factor. So for TM is more significant the pH, the salt concentration, the combination of the two, or what? And of course we can determine the optimum setting. So which means we can determine the best um, formulation. And here it is exactly what I meant in the previous slide. We have a series of output, here I select some of them, uh, as a function of the salt concentration and of the pH. And we have the complete surface based on the data we got. And the thing is that anyhow, the prediction power of this surface is rather limited because they are product independent. So all the result uh, or all the surfaces are going to be different protein by protein. But based on the structural information we have on the protein, thanks to the homology modeling, we can actually maybe figure out why the surface is changing. We have a series of antibody which are different to one each other and if the KD is shifting in a certain way maybe we can figure out what was the problem. So if it is an hydrophobic patch or whatever. But another thing we want to do of course is to use molecular descriptor to try to generate a global algorithm. So all these algorithms are extremely helpful and show that we have a complete understanding of the system but at the end, uh, our final goal would be to generate a global algorithm. And for example, the neural network algorithm I will show you at the end is in that direction. So we have a global algorithm for antibodies for predicting some of these outputs. And I hope that I convince you that our systematic approach actually helped to indicate which are the key biophysical property for protein formulation and the application of data mining techniques or like classical one like responsive phase methodology or 
as we will see at the end of this presentation, a machine learning algorithm can actually improve our understanding of problem solution behavior. And I also hope that you are thrilled to see our database since we really believe that this can enable a rapid uh, and cost sparing developability assessment. The last thing that I want to highlight is that all the data you see now, they were just a part of this big screening and the, all this big screening, the 75% of the data point were actually collected by Dynapro, Play, Twitter and the uh, Sykes Exclusion Commodore coupled to a Trios and an OptiLab. So you can see the impact of light scattering on protein formulation development. We spent some time now talking about protein formulation screening, but of course this screening uh, involves a series of standard approaches to study um, the stability of protein. But I wanted to show you in this webinar at least one new approach to study the physical stability of monoclonal antibody using the Dynapro plate treater. And here on the top you can see all the phases of the scientists involved in the, uh, in the project. And the idea of this project, so the concept of the project, is that if we start from a situation in which we have MAP monomers and we incubate in guadalinium hydrochloride, we know that we can actually follow the perturbation of the structure by intrinsic protein fluorescence. And if we then dilute this uh, solution in, with buffer, then if we have protein with low physical stability we will have a final solution with larger aggregates or more aggregates than a situation in which you have high physical stability where you will have less or smaller protein aggregates and since dynamic light scattering is of course very sensible to aggregates and is high throughput then of course is the technique that was selected for studying this concept. So in this work we studied two protein and uh, here on the, on the graph you can see the autodynamic radius resulting after dilution from a solution where adenium hydrochloride had a concentration of 0, 1 and so on until 4 for both protein. And those um, protein were studied at different pH, 5, 5.75, with two different buffers, so histidine and citrate. And you can see that the best concentration we figured out that was giving the, the, the more reliable result was 3, um, three molar of guadalinium hydrochloride, so before dilution, where you can see actually the, the biggest difference here, and the same was also with the other protein. And the idea is that this formulation uh, have a low protein uh, physical stability, while this formulation have the highest. And you can see that the, the same uh, trend we can see also for the other proteins. So starting from citrate 5.75, then we have histidine pH 5, citrate 5.75 and histidine 5. It's the same here. And of course we want also to see how this uh, other dynamic radius after dilution here on the right of the table is relating to other parameters. In this case we have a colloidal stability indicator and five conformational stability indicator. So these two related to the stress by temperature and these three related to the stress uh, by um, uh, chemical stress, so using uh, guadalinium hydrochloride. And you can see that using two different buffer, so histidine and citrate, but the same um, pH, we have very similar uh, conformational stability and the way that we are actually differentiating here by this aerodynamic radius is based on the colloidal uh, stability. So you can see that here are in the, the histidine and citrate the number are almost the same but for KD and in fact when the KD is negative or at least um, lower then uh, in this case we get higher 
uh, aerodynamic radius, so more aggregates than in this case. And this is similar here. We have a more stable formulation conformationally, and as you see here, the numbers are lower than here. Uh, but again, we can differentiate it where the conformational stability is better based on this kg, but thanks to this value, so the aerodynamic radius, we just need one value to get the whole picture. And we were also interested to have a look to, uh, on the effect of the additives, and for that we focus on the histidine buffer alone. And this graph is representing the change in the dynamic radius from the formulation with the um, histidine alone, and in this case this is zero, of course, and with different additives that are here, and which are excipients that are usually used in uh, formulation development for stabilizing for stabilizing protein. And you can see that in general after the erosion from the natron we get uh, less aggregates or smaller aggregates using these additives. So in conclusion, from our point of view the aggregation tracked by dynapropate twitter after dilution um, from different concentration of collinium hydrochloride is a very promising approach to probe the protein physical stability in different formulation. And firstly, first the method is isothermal, so we just avoid all the problem uh, arising from sample eating, like for example the shift in pH uh, due to the, the different temperature. And it can distinguish between overlapping curves in an ICD experiment, which means that you can actually distinguish two formulations that have the same conformational stability based on their colloidal stability. And uh, finally, it's a very short instrument and measurement time, and has a high potential for scale down and, and automatization. So far, we had uh, an overview about the formulation screening we're doing in, in the PP project, which is this standard procedure of accumulating data for, for, for the database and to new and novel approaches to study physical stability of protein. And here, finally, we are stepping into the machine learning part of, the, of this uh, webinar, which is about the application of machine learning to increase to problem formulation. And in our case, we developed an artificial neural network uh, algorithm. An artificial neural network are really interesting because of their capacity to manage highly nonlinear uh, problem, which is often the case in the pharmaceutical development. And we won't step into an uh, artificial neural network uh, because this is a huge field, I mean as big as uh, the pharmaceutical one. So we can imagine, uh, if, you, if you have no um, idea of what a neural network is, you can imagine this as a black box algorithm in where you can actually feed in data and uh, from this data the algorithm is trained to then predict um, to then predict new a new data set. So for example here we have as inputs the information about the primary sequence, so those are the amino acids, and information about the formulation, and we would get out at the end the temperature of aggregation, and we will train on a data set, and then on a different one we will validate the model. But this black box idea on, on, of the neural networks is also not that far from truth, because the major drawback of neural network is their interpretability, and we will see together where we We'll try to figure it out uh, a way to have a qualitative understanding of how the neural network were, was made was making decision. And let's see how we manage to predict. So how well uh, our algorithm can actually predict certain output. And in our case here we have TM, TAG, and the sine of KD. And in this case the uh, prediction is very accurate, so you can see that TM actually is very well predicted. And the black dots in this case are the training set, while the red one are about the 
uh, validation set in all the cases. So now you may wonder why this sign of KD and not uh, KD itself. So this is because uh, most of the KD values in the pre prefer screening are um, negative because we have two thirds of our data set which is with salt. So if you remember the slide of the KD, so most of our 70% of the data set is about being negative. So the neural network is well trained on negative data points and not on positive. So the regression problem is very difficult to solve. Uh, is solving all the negative case but not the positive one. Um, and then so we focused on the sign of KD for, for in, in this case. And uh, regarding the cross validation, you may want to have a look to the uh, publication when it's submitted. So how we actually did cross validate with status, which is as we said, uh, really important from in the case of uh, machine learning. But we were not only interested in predicting uh, output like TM, but also the monomer loss after stress. And here again, we have different shapes, which is different uh, stressing temperature. Everything is two weeks here. And we are predict predicting M, which is the monomer uh, retention after stress. And you can see here that also here the prediction is um, fairly uh, accurate if you think that this is just about aggregation based only on primary sequence. But you cannot really um, distinguish between different formulation because of all this, um, let's call uh, all this noise here. But you can fairly predict if your protein is more stable than another. So all the red point here in this case is one protein and as you see they are all most of the points are shifted on the right, so which means you can actually differentiate between different protein um, before even before expression. Um, now, one of the major drawback of the neural network are the interpretability, and what we did here is we took a trained network. Uh, so where the thickness of this arrow uh, mean the different weights and we looked at the output and which hidden layer was more affecting the output and from this we look again which of the parameters were impacting the hidden layer more we took these two parameters so x1 and x2 and we just did a response to frame methodology using the, the parameter and the, the combination of those two factors to extrapolate which were the leading parameter that uh, that are important or they are deemed important for, for the network to make the decision. So we are trying to delve into in a qualitative way into the decision making process of the of the network. And here we go. Uh, here we have the results of the responsive state methodology using the leading parameters from the network. And you can see that here there is actually a pretty good fitting. So the conclusion that we can make here on the decision making problem of the network could be quite accurate. But we have to recognize that what I will, we are saying right now is not anymore about the procedure itself, but more about how the network thinks about the procedures. And then we said at the beginning that you cannot know the truth by machine learning, but just correlation. So we will figure out certain correlation that the neural network inside the algorithm um, did it by itself, maybe giving to us some further information about the process. Since in this slide, you can see the leading parameters in the decision-making procedure of the um, neural networks. And the nice things from my side was that the leading amino acid uh, has usually a specific role in the physical process related to the output parameters. 
and we can make an example here like with with TM of course with TM the tryptophan is going to be very important or the cysteine is going to be very important again and we are expecting of course that pH have an influence or the salt concentration have an influence uh, but of course how the, the, the neural network figure out that this guy is the, is the most important one uh, that's um, that's very difficult to to, to, to to know a priori because it's, it's very complicated to, to, to interpret uh, a neural network and this is true for all uh, all the cases here everything makes quite sense in the case of the aggregation for example we have also methionine and this extreme the effect here is extreme this is most probably due through the aggregation through um, um, of oxidated sp ox oxidated species species for example because for TAG we have again methionine and the input uh, is not only on methionine as in this case for, 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 the, for the amino acids uh, because here we are stretching for two weeks but temperatures oxidation is, is probably more important than here where also other amino acids are and in this case are charged amino acid and as we see from the um, proximity energy framework of course the charge is very important for the aggregation process and so on so I hope to I show you one application of artificial neural network and from our, our point of view, this is represent a very interesting alternative to classical statistical methodologies, since when it is applied to high, highly nonlinear data set, uh, can be pretty successful. And this is uh, this kind of data set are often encountered in pharmaceutical industry. Um, the application of these kind of models uh, can be used to optimize biologics based on amino acid composition. And would allow, and what is very important to stress out in the conclusion is that it would allow the selection of protein structure with good predicting TM, TA, KV, and in certain cases of uh, monomer retention even before they are expressed in cell. Because the only thing that you need is the primary sequence, and then you can see the, the, this output as a function of pH and, and salt concentration. And moreover, of course, since you have it as a function of pH and salt concentration, it would be also possible to reduce the number of formulation condition. So essentially, after collecting all this data, thanks to artificial neural network, we managed to uh, get um, models to predict some of the outputs, at least in, 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 this, um, in this work, which was based on a part of, of the screen. So now we will have a summary. So this is the we are nearly to to the end of the webinar. In this summary, we saw at the beginning that high throughput light scattering is the perfect tool for uh, screen any depth characterization of protein physical stability, and that once online, we hope that the PP database can enable rapid uh, rapid material and cost sparing developability assessment thanks also to machine learning algorithm which can allow data driven prediction or decision finally we are at the end of this webinar and this is the part which i hate most especially when i'm short in time like in this moment because it's so difficult to acknowledge everybody and we are such a big consortium uh, so i will just say a big thanks to everybody and I want to especially to thank uh, my supervisor at Wyatt and my supervisors at um, my university in Munich. And of course a big thanks goes also to you all in the internet world for the kind attention. And with that I give the word back to Elisabeth. Thank you very much Lorenzo. We do have time for a couple questions. So let's get started. Our first question is from Christine. When you had different populations, for example, aggregated and non-aggregated, how did you determine the RH? So the, the idea is that uh, when you're determining uh, aerodynamic sizes, we are talking about apparent uh, aerodynamic radius. And uh, if at, at the end you get the data, so you're, you have always to think about your raw data, this is the autocorrelation function, and the aerodynamic radius that you get 
uh, it's a fitting of this. So when the fitting of one exponential function only uh, is fitting well enough, then this apparent uh, radius is, is the one that you're using. And this is mostly the cases when you have monomodal distribution. In other case, when this, when only one exponential is not enough, then you have to go to, for, for a series of exponential. And uh, in this case, then you have a size distribution. You can actually separate. And in dynamics, you have two different algorithms for doing that. So one is called cumulant and one is called regularization. And from my point of view, when you can use the cumulant one, this is better because it's more robust and sound mathematically. And when you have a multimodal sample, then you should, of course, move to the regularization. And these questions goes back to we want to represent everything in one number, uh, but it's not always um, always possible. So when you can use one number, other dynamics says that, that that's OK. But then we are cases in which you have like plenty of aggregates, then maybe you want to uh, use a different kind of analysis. All right, thank you so much. Our next question is from Sophia. What difference in RH is considered significant? For example, for monoclonal antibody formulation, is an increase from 7 nanometers to 8 nanometers significant? Yes, in, 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 the, in our case, this is definitely significant. So we're talking about 1 nanometer. So the sensibility of the plate reader is about 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Uh, if you're talking about, for example, the unfolding of, of an antibody, you would expect a difference from the native state to the unfolded one of 0 0.4, 0 0.5 maybe maximum. And this is something that you can actually see at the end. So yes, it's definitely significant. Excellent. Now we have a question from Hank. Very nice data, Lorenzo, on protein-protein interaction and neural decision making. Industry products often contain more complex systems, such as protein-protein interaction, in the presence of other components in formulation, such as excipients and lipid emulsions. Can these DLS tools and machine learning be applied to such complex systems containing multiple components? So th that's for sure. So the, we showed now only the first step, which is, of course, uh, easier to handle because it's not with excipients and, and with lipid dimensions. But of course, this is something that, that you can do. So the more complex is the system, uh, the more complex a network you need. That, that's for sure for what concern the, the, the neural network part. part. Um, and uh, and then the more d data you need, that, that's for sure. For what concern the protein-protein uh, interaction, then uh, of course uh, you, this is also possible. Uh, let's say that, that when you have, for example, small protein, it uh, can be a bit more tricky, or when you have lipid emulsion, emulsion uh, the, the micelles should not be too big, for example. So there can be some uh, some issues, there can, can be some challenge regarding excipients. For example, sugar is known that they are forming uh, small uh, particles. And you can see this by uh, DLS, but it's not a problem because they are not covering really the, really the signal. Uh, but it, it's for sure possible. Thank you. Our next question is from Luis. You mentioned 3M denaturant, but what is the effect of time exposed to denaturant on these values? So the denaturant, if I got the question of time exposed, you mean how much we, we left the, uh, the sample there. So the, we kept the sample 24 hours, so we let it unfold. And of course, we followed uh, during the, the, the method development the, the unfolding curve to see that was uh, over after 24 hours. So usually for our antibody after 18 hours was uh, um, unfolding uh, for what concerns, so completely, so it was stable, let's say. So yes, we waited that time. And this is, of course, something that's always necessary to give it the time to equilibrate. And uh, yeah, and I, I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Our final question, as we're starting to run out of time, let's say we only have high throughput DLS and a low throughput differential scanning calorimetry instrument. What kind of workflow would you suggest for protein formulation development? 
Okay, I guess this is a, a situation of uh, like a university or smaller company in which uh, you cannot have everything and then you have to make some, some decision or what, what to have. And if you have a DLS screening, um, a DLS plate reader, then of course the workflow from my point of view would be to do a complete DLS screening. Let's focus, for example, in the case of the temperature of aggregation uh, against the temperature of, of, uh, of unfolding. And then you you would have this parallel screening, so complete by DLS, and then you would start with a prediction of your TM even before going uh, to to measure. Even a blunt prediction is not necessary. Uh, neural network, even something an idea, so that you can have a proper design of experiment. And you would design your experiment, for example, with a fractional design or two level fractional design or two half fractional design, depending from the, the condition you want to measure your TM. Once you have designed your experiment, you would run uh, the, the, the measurement with, with, with your TM. And then you would just double check if your runs are uh, lying on uh, your prediction or not. And then you may decide to have some more um, measurement or not and then ba basically then you would select uh, the um, the formulation with higher temperature of aggregation and higher temperature of unfold folding to have the the, the most uh, the most stable one so usually when you have a, a low throughput uh, dsc for example i would recommend to look into the prediction to look in the sign of experiment and use the measurement to double check your uh, sample um, surface and if you have no prediction you should at least have like 20 25 percentage of the data point you want to have usually with the sentinel experiment so this is the workflow i would use and the other way around is difficult because prediction of tm and dg are far more accurate than the one for, for of tag and uh, aerodynamic radius aggregation so i would definitely not do the other way around with that, I would like to say thank you so much, Lorenzo Gentiluomo, and thank you to Wyatt for sponsoring today's web symposium. I hope that you got some useful information from today's webinar. Thank you again. Bye-bye.